So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today to talk about a very topical and timely issue of um, safety tips when covering election-related events. And I think you will hear a lot of information that um, will be app applicable in a lot of different situations as well. But um, now is a particularly important time to be thinking about um, not only doing a great job covering the news, but also making sure that you stay safe. Um, so I'm Claire Norens. I'm the director of the UGA Laws First Amendment Clinic. And I'm also a board member of the Georgia First Amendment Foundation, who is graciously hosting this webinar today. And I want to introduce you to the rest of our panel. So first joining us is Erica Henry. She is an experienced news executive who spent 25 years at CNN, where she was most recently the vice president of news for CNN US um, covering the Southeast region. And she is a member of the board of directors for the Georgia First Amendment Foundation as well. She also serves as board chair for the Diversity Pledge Institute and is a co-chair for Atlanta's um, chapter of the Duke Alumni Association. Um, Henry resides in Atlanta and is the proud mother of three. Um, Grace Lane is our next presenter. She is a third year law student at the University of Georgia and a proud double dog as she also earned her undergraduate degree from UGA. She has externed with the athens Clark County State Court and also with the United States District Court for the Northern District of Georgia in Atlanta. And this year she is excited to serve on the executive board for the Georgia Law Review. And most importantly, she's working in the UGA's First Amendment Clinic. Um, next, we have Jackson Rowe, who is a second year law student at UGA. He is originally from Nashville, Tennessee, and he received his bachelor's degree in English literature from the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. He spent the last summer working for a public defender on gang related and RICO cases in Georgia, and he also works this semester in the UGA's First Amendment Clinic. So with that, I will turn it over to our presenters to take it away. Thank you, Claire. There we go. Thank you, Claire. Um, and as you said, this is the uh, journalist safety training reporting on the 2024 elections. And as you all know, um, this is a very, um, this is an historic election. And there were um, some lessons learned in um, 2020. And so we just wanted to make sure that any journalist, any reporter who's going out in the field, we wanted to make sure that we gave you enough um, tips um, and advice and things to think about, things to discuss with your editors, with your managers, um, and just making sure that um, you cover the story because it is so incredibly important that journalists witness what is happening um, in Georgia, but also we just wanted to make sure that you are safe. And so now we're just gonna um, share some statistics with you and while working with um, political journalists in, tw in 2024 in, um, in swing states, almost 38% of journalists reported being threatened with or experiencing physical violence. Almost 31% of journalists reported being threatened with or experiencing digital violence. And we're gonna um, talk about that later on in this presentation. And um, something that we're seeing growing here, and that's um, almost 27% of journalists reported legal threats or actions against them. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna um, have um, four parts of this um, conversation. The first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna share um, with you some topical um, stories, um, issues, uh, stories that were covered um, in 2024. Then we're gonna give you some tools so that you can sort of have some sort of a pre-risk assessment before deciding on where you're gonna go and report on the story. Then we're gonna give you some on the scene advice. So you've decided that you're gonna go and you're gonna report from a certain location. We're gonna give you some advice to make sure that um, you are safe there. And then we're gonna talk about um, some post coverage precautions. And um, I, I'm almost scared to say post coverage um, precautions because we all realize that um, if you remember in 2020, this election was not decided on election night and uh, Georgia being a swing state. We now know that um, there's the uh, state board of elections has now um, has something before us. I know it's being challenged, but every vote must be hand counted. So we know it's going to be a long 
night and potentially a long couple of day days. But that being said, we are still going to have um, some post coverage precautions for you for after covering um, the elections. And so um, looking at some of the stories uh, that were covered um, in 2024, um, you'll remember um, in the spring of 2024, there was a lot of attention and a lot of emphasis that was um, given to um, the, 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 the story about um, campus protests and students that were protesting against their universities and um, where their university, um, their stance on what was happening um, in with the um, conflict between Israel and Palestine. And specifically here in Georgia, or you'll remember here in Georgia, that um, the journalists in the, in the state, they were covering the protests at Emory University. And for the most part, as with most of the coverage of the protests, um, it, it was peaceful. But then at one point, um, 28 um, people ended up being arrested at the protest at Emory University. And from those who were either protests or journalists who were on the scene, there were reports of tear gas, rubber bullets, and tasers being used by law enforcement against the protesters. And what was happening was that journalists were being caught um, in the middle and they were experiencing some of the same things that the protesters were experiencing in the rubber bullets and the, um, and the, and the, uh, the pepper spray or tear gas. And also um, you'll notice that um, at a political rallies, um, it's becoming a little bit more tense um, at these um, political rallies and journalists in the field, sometimes people who go to protests are very passionate. Um, and sometimes the animus that they have is sometimes aimed at and geared towards journalists. And we want, again, it's important that you get out there and you get the story, but that also that you stay safe. And I don't need to remind you all that, you know, there already have been um, two alleged, alleged uh, assassinations attempts against them. Um, Donald Trump. And again, there's just been a lot of um, intensity and a lot of um, animus um, directed towards journalists. And so that being said, now we're going to take you to through, um, starting with our preliminary risk assessment. Yes. All right. Well, thank you so much, Erica, for being with us today and for providing that background. Now, bearing all of that context in mind, we want to give you some more practical tips so that you all can keep providing necessary coverage of this election, but also keep yourselves physically, mentally, and digitally safe as well. As Erica mentioned at the beginning, we're going to start with what you should do before you ever set foot on location. And some of these things may seem obvious to you, but it is really important to consider all of them before you go. So the first major question that you should ask yourself before going out in the field to cover a story is what kinds of risks might I encounter there? Ask yourself, is the crowd likely to be agitated already from the subject matter that might be the case during a heated election season? How crowded do you think the space might be? Is there thus an increased risk for mob behavior or trampling? You also want to consider whether or not law enforcement will be present and whether or not there might be that risk that they'll use tear gas or rubber bullets or if they'll be making arrest on the scene. You should also think about how likely the event is to be the target of gun violence. That may seem intuitive, but you should be aware there's a higher chance of gun violence when the gathering is particularly divisive, like at a political rally, as we were just talking about. Again, none of this is meant to be fear-mongering or encouraging you to only think of worst case scenario when you go to a scene, but thinking through all the possibilities ahead of time can help you be well prepared if you do encounter a risk. So it's really best to just think of this section as a mental checklist to go through. You also want to consider who should go. Uh, ideally, you should not be by yourself when you're on an assignment. You want to have a team with you. You want colleagues around you not only to make the job more efficient, but also to have people watching your back just in case things get tense. When you're getting your team together, consider the practical skills of each member, but also the group's overall chemistry. Naturally, you'll want to include at least one person who has had experience covering whatever type of event you're covering, 
but you also want the team to be as comfortable with each other as possible so that communication will be a lot easier during critical moments. And just in case the team does get separated from one another on the scene, we also recommend establishing some sort of consistent check-in procedure. An easy way to do this is to just use like text messages to give each other periodic status updates. It's also a good idea to have your emergency contact phone numbers written on a piece of paper or, or on your arm, um, just in case you get separated from your phone or your battery dies. Emergency contacts would include a lawyer, a legal hotline, your editor if you have one, and a trusted friend or family. And if you're a journalist that's flying solo, most of the advice still applies. You want to let your family and your colleagues know where you're going. You want to check in with them periodically once you get there. Keep emergency contacts on your person. Um, but, but still, we'd really like to encourage you to have somebody with you if possible. It could even be a friend who's not a journalist. Also, talk to other journalists who are there at the event. Other journalists are your friends and not your enemies. Um, you're all on the same team, so do not be afraid to go and talk to them, even if they're from like a competing organization. You really just want somebody there to watch your back while you're trying to get the story. You'll also want to ask yourself how familiar you are with the location. In the same way you want to be comfortable with your team members, you also want to be comfortable with the location you're working at. You want to be focused on the assignment while you're on the scene, and you don't want to be looking at like Google Maps, trying to figure out where the heck you are and where you're going. The best way to get familiar with the location is just to go there prior to the event uh, and scope it out. Depending on the event you're covering, you might not need to do this. Uh, for example, if it's a part of town you're already really familiar with, but if it's a location you've never been to before, you probably want to visit it ahead of time. The second best way is to just bring someone with you who's already been there and knows the location, but still, at the very least, you should look at the map and look online for other people's experiences at the location just to try to get a mental picture of what you're getting into so you're not completely disoriented when you're missing. Another thing that you want to consider when before you go to the scene is whether it's going to be dark outside. If it is, you need to be sure that you have either a physical flashlight that you can use or ensure that you have enough charge on your phone so that you can use that as your flashlight. It's never a bad idea to bring a portable charger for your phone, and that's particularly true if you plan to use it as your light. The next tip on this slide may seem like the most obvious out of all of these, but please do remember to check the weather forecast before you go, particularly if the event is outside. Make sure you won't be uncomfortably hot or cold because of your clothing choices. And you should also be mindful that visibility may be decreased if there's fog or rain. That again goes to making sure you have a light source. You don't wanna lose any of your senses while you're on location. You should also think ahead about anything that you may need to protect your equipment in bad weather. So make sure your camera bag is waterproof or bring extra raincoats or ponchos to wrap around any of your delicate equipment. Just don't be caught off guard by a sudden storm. The next big item on the checklist is what should you wear to this event? The most important thing to remember here is that you wanna be able to move around easily and safely. So wear closed toed shoes and pants instead of skirts or dresses. You don't want your clothing to be too loose where the fabric can be easily grabbed and you need to be safe about your fabric choices. So try to make sure that they're not flammable. So avoid cotton or linen. Also, it's probably best to not wear anything that's particularly expensive or flashy that could attract unwanted attention towards you. Along those same lines, try to leave anything that's particularly sentimental to you at home. You don't want to end up in a situation where you've dropped something like a really meaningful necklace, but then the crowd is too volatile for you to get to it. It's just best to avoid that entirely. You should also try to take a minute before you go and research the event and see if there's anything posted online or if there are flyers advertising the event that describes what participants may be wearing. If it's possible, you want to try to avoid blending in too much with people participating in the event. That's particularly true if it's a protest and the police may be involved. So for example, if you see something that says participants are all wearing black, you may wanna choose another color and perhaps a color that's far away from black and couldn't be confused. 
Or if there's a particular hat that everyone is wearing, you may want to try to avoid wearing a hat at all, even if it's not the exact same hat, just to decrease the risk that in a chaotic situation, somebody confuses you with a participant and targets you because of that. Another big tip that you should consider about what you're going to be wearing is that you need to be prepared if the police start using tear gas. There's kind of a balancing act here. On one hand, tear gas can be deployed with very little warning in crowded situations, which creates chaos and during which you need to access personal protective equipment or PPE very quickly. But at the same time, you don't want to be the reason that people are anxious just because you're wearing your personal protective equipment before it's necessary. Other people looking around and seeing a journalist wearing PPE might itself incite panic. So ideally, what you want to do is create a go bag of sorts, a very easily accessible bag where you can reach PPE the second that you start to need it. You might have also heard that it's a good idea to keep a small container of milk in your bag to rinse your face after tear gas exposure. The most recent recommendation from the CDC is actually to use water rather than milk to flush out your eyes because milk can go bad if it's sitting in a bag for too long and then it can cause bacterial infections. So our recommendation is to try to keep a full water bottle in your go bag with your PPE that you purposefully don't drink from so that you have it to wash your face if you are exposed to tear gas. The last little note about being prepared for tear gas is to wear your glasses instead of contacts if that applies to you. Tear gas can actually burn contacts to eyeballs, so it's safer to wear your glasses if you think there's any risk at all that tear gas is even a possibility. Another thing, to consider when you're deciding what you need to wear to this event is whether or not you should wear your media affiliations logo. I'll let Jackson speak to this a little bit more in a minute, but if your outlet's known for particularly partisan coverage, you might want to think twice before wearing the logo so that you are not personally targeted or confronted because of people's opinions on the outlet at large. It is probably a better idea to wear a generic press vest to alert police that you're a journalist and that people know around you that you're a journalist, but you should also be aware that that option may still expose you to some risk if there are anti-press protesters present. At the end of the day, how you want to identify yourself visually is a personal choice that you will need to make based on your own assessment of the particular risks of the situation. But regardless of what you choose to wear, it is always a good idea to have physical press credentials or a business card available to readily present to anyone who asks if you are working as a journalist, particularly the police, if they ask. And if Grace's advice about the clothing and personal protective equipment strikes you as a little excessive, uh, we'd like to re-emphasize that it's not excessive. This photo is from what started as a peaceful public gathering outside a public building in October of 2020 in North Carolina. It was a march and it was organized by a movement called I Am Change, which among other things is dedicated to encouraging people to get out to vote. That was the purpose of this march. As you can see from the picture, it was crowded, but everything was pretty peaceful. Police gave orders to disperse and when it took too long, they started pepper spraying people. The sense you get from Julia Wall's quotation, and she was a journalist that was there that day, is that it was not obvious why the police thought pepper spray was necessary. It came as kind of a surprise to her. So the moral of the story is that things don't have to be going completely haywire for the uh, police to start using pepper spray and tear gas, which is why you want proper PPE on hand always. And January 6th gives us a great example of the possible hazards of uh, displaying press logos. There are two quotations on the screen here, the first being from a CNN reporter who claimed that once protesters discovered he worked for CNN, his team was swabbed and sw swarmed and mobbed, excuse me. Uh, the, the second quote reports a similar story. Obviously, January 6th at the Capitol was a pretty chaotic place to be. But it is worth acknowledging that the general animus towards the media at this point in our political history is pretty negative. You want to think twice before openly identifying yourself as media. That goes for whether you work for a national media source or a local media source, even if it's a really small organization. Um, but as Grace said, we kind of have to qualify that statement a little bit because it may be good for you to wear something like a press vest that identifies you as a member of the press, so long as, as it's ambiguous about what particular organization you work for. 
And this is also pretty situation specific. Uh, if you're going to a Trump rally, for example, probably not a great idea to advertise that you work for MSNBC or CNN. And the same goes if you're going to a Harris rally, probably best not to advertise that you work for Fox. Uh, but uh, ultimately, it's a kind of a complicated issue, so you need to consider things. All right, so you've done all your proper preparation and then you've made it to the scene. This next set of tips are practical things to keep in mind once you're physically there. The first big thing that we wanna reemphasize is try to use the buddy system if at all possible. It's absolutely ideal for someone else who's physically there to know where you are and what you're doing and who you're interacting with at all times. That way you can take care of each other if anything happens. And again, even if you're the sole reporter for your outlet, try to see if you have a colleague from another news source who could tag team the event with you or bring a non-journalist friend to be your buddy at the scene or even just introduce yourself to other journalists that you see there. On a super practical point, if you're covering an outdoor or multi-level event, it's a good idea to try to get the highest vantage point that you possibly can right when you get there. Especially early on when you're trying to get oriented, it's really great to get a bird's eye view and, and take in the physical layout of the space, but also observe who is there already and how are they interacting and behaving. You can also use that time when you first get there to make note of the exits around you and then try to stay aware of the closest exit to you the whole time that you're there, even as you move around the scene. You also need to be alert to and try to avoid aggressors. Aggressors pose the biggest risk of real violence at this kind of event because things escalate very quickly. So avoid people that are very clearly under the influence of any kind of substance. When you do go to approach people, try to maintain eye contact, speak calmly, and watch their body language. If they seem unhappy to speak with you at all, or if they at any point become confrontational, just discontinue the interview entirely. If you're able to, it might be a good idea to just leave your camera on the whole time you're on the scene. If you do choose to do that, try not to walk around with it super obvious that you're recording, like holding a camera up to your eye, because people may react poorly if they feel like they're being filmed without their consent. But even if that means you can't get a great image as you film, it could be helpful to even have audio if something were to happen really quickly. Um, that can be used as evidence later on. But of course, do consider your own resources and decide whether it's even feasible for you to have the camera on the whole time. When you do decide that you wanna film with someone who's present at the event, it's generally a good idea to try to speak with a potential interview subject for a little while before you either turn that camera on or just make them aware that the camera is on um, if it already has been. If the interaction is going well, you can let them know when you're turning the camera on. And then if necessary, repeat some of the same questions they've already answered for you to lay the foundation if you need that on camera. Easing in that way is just an easy way to help people feel more relaxed and it decreases the chance that they react poorly to being filmed or they start to perform for the camera and act differently. The last major tip here is to try to use your peripheral vision and hearing to remain alert to bystanders and what they're doing. We understand that this is an extremely difficult thing to do in practice when you're trying to focus on conducting an interview. So again, if you are able to use the buddy system, that's great because then they can fill that role for you and keep an eye on what's going on around you when you're focused. But even if you're alone, do try your best to still be mindful of who else is around you and what else is going on around you, even while your attention is diverted elsewhere. Yeah, and like Grace said, uh, we understand that we're giving you a lot to think about, especially considering you're you know, trying to do your job as a journalist at the same time. But the most important thing is to just make sure you pay attention. This slide introduces you to the idea of situational awareness as represented by the little pyramid there. The pyramid shows you different states of awareness. The extremes, which are the white and the black, represent uh, unawareness, which is kind of your normal walking down the street whistling pedestrian attitude. Um, and then panic is the black, which is where you just freeze out and you don't know what to do. Naturally, you'd never wanna be in those two states. Uh, 
The sweet spot where you do want to be is in the yellow. In the yellow state, you're aware, you're still relaxed, but you're engaged and you're keeping an eye out. If, an, if a threat does come up, you want to be in the orange sort of section, which is alert. Uh, that means you're recogni you've recognized a threat and you're ready to respond if need be. Um, the biggest challenge to maintaining situational awareness is mental fatigue. It's going to creep up on you if you're on the scene for long enough. You'll get tired and you start to prioritize immediate tasks like interviewing a subject, but neglecting the peripheral tasks like keeping an eye on bystanders and watching out for threats. This is yet another reason why it's important to have people with you so that you aren't having to do everything yourself and so that if you are distracted, someone's there to watch your back. And it's also important to know your limits. If you're so exhausted that you can no longer maintain the level of awareness that you need to keep yourself safe, it's probably uh, time to consider packing up and moving. Also, if you're gonna be covering a polling place, you should know that the state of Georgia has specific rules for what you can do outside and inside a polling place as a reporter. So I'm gonna go through those. You are allowed to go into a polling place to observe, but you can't enter an enclosed space, which is a special legal term but basically what it refers to is the spot that they have roped off for people to actually go in and cast their ballots. Uh, you can, you also can't take any photos or videos inside the polling place. And if you want to do any exit polling, you have to do it more than 25 feet outside the exit of the building. Those are the rules for the state of Georgia, but depending on the specific county you're in, there may be additional rules and regulations. So you want to research those ahead of time before going to the polling place. Uh, or you could just talk to the poll workers when you arrive. That'll be a good thing to like let them know that you're willing to cooperate with them and also get the rules for uh, whatever specific county you're in. Also, for the open carry folks, it is illegal to have a gun within 150 feet of a polling place in Georgia. So if you open carry yourself, don't bring a gun to the polling place. And if you see people there with guns, be aware that they're not allowed to do that and that's a problem. All right, so this is a subsection of our on the scene advice that specifically deals with interacting with the police. So the most important thing if you're interacting with the police is just to stay cognizant of them and their mood and movements and to listen out for their orders and instructions. It's also not a bad idea when you first get to the scene to go up to a police officer if things are calm enough and introduce yourself as a journalist. If anything does happen down the line at the event, it can be helpful if they are aware of who you are already. The other two tips here are about being prepared for an interaction with the police. So you need to be sure that you have your government ID somewhere easily accessible. It's really best to keep both a picture of it on your phone and a hard copy so that is separate from your phone in case you don't have access to your phone for some reason or you've lost your hard copy, you have a backup of either one. And you should do the same with your media credentials if you can. So you have something both hard copy form and on your phone that you can easily show to police um, to demonstrate that you are a member of the press. Erica was just telling us about these new e-business cards. So that could be a great way to just easily swipe in and show the police officers that you are in fact a journalist. You also should either memorize or write on your arms the number of who you will call if you do get arrested. We suggest going either the memorization route or writing it physically on your body rather than trying to keep it in your phone or on a physically written piece of paper. Because again, you might not have access to your phone, particularly if you're interacting with police and they've taken your phone into custody or if you've lost it. But hopefully you always have your either your memory or your arms at all times on the event. <laughs> If your organization has a lawyer, you should carry that lawyer's number and try to let that lawyer know ahead of time what event you're going to and what risks you think you've thought about that you might encounter there. Also, if you do have an editor, you could carry their number with you too. Editors can be particularly effective and persistent advocates with the police, and that can really help shorten the amount of time that you are detained if you are detained. And if neither of those are options for you, you can carry the number of a legal hotline. This number here at the bottom of this slide is a hotline for the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press. 
that could be a good one to keep on you if anything were to happen. And of course, if it isn't memorized, you should carry the number of your most reliable friend or family member on your body. It's also too important to remember that journalists are not a specially protected class of individuals. Um, you have the same rights as everybody else, which is not nothing, but it's not limit limitless. Journalists are required to abide by reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions, for example, just like everybody else is. Uh, you may be asking yourself, what is a time, place, and manner restriction? The answer is it's a legal rule that applies to everybody out of location. An example would be that you have to stay on a sidewalk and out of the street, or that you can't block entrances to buildings. These restrictions will not necessarily be posted anywhere, so make sure you listen to police instructions about where you should be and where you shouldn't. But generally, you have a right to be present in public places. You can't trespass on private property. Um, when you are in an outdoor public place, like a street or a sidewalk, you typically have the right to film anything that's in plain view. That said, if you're inside a public building or if you're on private property, there may be rules against recording that you're gonna have to abide by. Uh, but it's good to know that if you, you are on private property, you can get permission to be there and to record, but be aware that police might not always respect that or be aware of that. You also just as a general good rule of thumb have to listen to the police when they tell you things. Uh, if the police give a dispersal order, you have to heed it unless you've spoken to police and gotten permission to stay. When police issue a dispersal order, they've got to give you notice of the order and a reasonable opportunity to comply. They should tell you how much time you have to disperse, the consequences of failing to disperse, and which way to exit. If the police aren't giving you this information, it's okay to ask them for it, and it's also okay to record yourself asking for it. We might even recommend that because if the police aren't properly carrying out a dispersal order, a recording could be good evidence of that later on. In a perfect world, the police would know the law and strictly, strictly adhere to it, but that is not the world we've lived in, unfortunately. So ultimately, you want to trust your gut on when it's time to leave, even if the police have not provided all the information they're supposed to. Talk with your editor prior to going about what they expect of you, whether they expect you to stay at the risk of being arrested or whether they expect you to get out and not get arrested. You don't wanna be caught in a situation like we talked about with the I am change march, where you just have a bunch of people moseying around and they end up getting pepper sprayed for staying too long. You also wanna keep in mind that police officers may not confiscate or demand to view your photographs, your videos, or your reporting notes without a warrant or a subpoena. And that is generally true even if police have arrested you and taken your phone into their custody. Um, but you should also be aware that if you do consent to show the police anything on your phone, even if it's as simple as one photograph, that may constitute consent for them to view all of your photographs and videos. So it is really best to just make it very clear that you do not consent if they ask to view your material. And remember that police officers may not delete or destroy your data or notes under any circumstances. And if you find yourself in a situation where you have been actually arrested, the most important thing that you can do is try to remain as calm as possible. I know that's a difficult thing to do in that kind of situation, but just do not arrest, resist arrest because that could result in the police using force against you. Remember that you have the right to remain silent, so don't volunteer information. When you're asked to identify yourself, state that you're a journalist first and then provide only your name, your address, and the name of the media company with which you're affiliated, if any, at most, in addition to your age. And present the, the officer with your press credentials if you can. When you say, I am a journalist, say, I am a journalist as many times as you possibly can. And then, if at all possible, ask explicitly if you're being detained and make them say, yes, you are being detained. Once the police have arrested you, they will likely search you and they may take custody of your equipment. But remember that they still do not have a right to open your phone or any of your notes. So it's a good idea here, just on a practical note, to change your phone to be a manual passcode that only you know in your head, rather than using biometrics like Face ID. So you don't want the police to be able to just hold up your phone to your face and unlock it. 
Um, if, if the police do insist on looking at what's on your phone, be sure to confirm verbally that they are requiring you to show them things and say again as many times as you can that you do not consent to a search. And on that same note, try to record the encounter if you can or have your buddy or friend record it if it's at all possible. And even if you can't get a good, get a good image of the interaction, even getting audio of the interaction can be extremely important, especially if it turns out the police body cam isn't working. So next, we're going to discuss some tips for digital safety and protecting your mental health after the actual event. So the most important thing in this section, as demonstrated by that little graphic on the left, is to physically remove yourself from the situation before you start reflecting on your gathered material and actually reporting. Just don't stay in any kind of potentially dangerous situation any longer than you must to get the story that you want. This slide is about doxing. Uh, as a journalist, you are kind of a public figure, even if you don't feel like a public figure. You should take precautions as if you were one. If you're unfamiliar with the term doxing, now is a good time to learn it. To so dox someone is to search for and publish private or identifying information about a particular individual on the internet, so typically with malicious intent. That's Google's definition. This is essentially an internet-based form of harassment. I've seen situations where people will find someone's home address on the internet, call the cops from an anonymous number and report that a crime is happening at that, addre that address just to get police to go and you know bother you for no reason. In order to avoid things like that happening to you, you need to clean up your online identity. Make sure your personal accounts, if you have them, are private and don't divulge too much information. Make sure your passwords aren't all the same and aren't things like capital P password, one, two, three, exclamation point. Um, and also, you should talk to your friends and family members about what they post about you. If someone is internet savvy and malicious, they will be able to find your spouse's social media, for example, and get information about you that way. So just make sure you have that conversation with your family and friends about what you're comfortable with them posting about you. And if you decide you want to take extra precautions regarding data protection, there are a lot of different cybersecurity services that you can sign up for. Delete Me and Recorded Future are examples, and these can work both for individual journalists and organizations. Also, you want to try using work phones and not personal phones, if at all possible. If a phone ends up lost or stolen, you do not want it to be the phone that you have all your personal information on. You also need to take care of yourself mentally as well. So sometimes when stories are really controversial, as all of the stories surrounding this historic election are bound to be, journalists can come under attack personally and protect yourself from that by making sure all your personal accounts are private. Don't accept followers on a personal account if you don't know them personally. Additionally, if you get any kind of harassing message, block or mute that account immediately. If you feel uncomfortable or generally upset by your online engagement, it's totally okay to consider taking a break from being online at all. And then you should find somebody that you trust that you feel like you can talk to, whether that's a friend, a family member, a colleague, or a mental health professional. A colleague may actually be a great option here because they may have real life experience about that unique feeling of being a journalist online. So don't be afraid to talk about how you feel And on that note, we conclude our presentation. So thank you all for showing up and listening on this Thursday afternoon. And uh, we will field any questions that you have. Yeah, so if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, this um, presentation has been recorded. So if you have colleagues who wanted to attend but weren't able to make this time, um, it will be posted on the Georgia First Amendment Foundation's YouTube uh, channel where you can find also other prior trainings that have been offered through GVAF. Um, so we'll circulate that link once the, the video is posted. And um, we'll give it a minute if we have any questions coming in. I don't see any yet.
All right. Well, thank you everyone so much for joining and enjoy the rest of your afternoon.